And he also talked about the last days. Not his last days, but our last days on this earth. Amen. He talked about the seasons and, and, and that, that we should know things about what is to come. That we be not fearful. But I, I want to look at a couple of specific verses this morning. If you'll turn with me to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. This will be our launching point this morning. As we take off and what... It, if you can't have fun with a word like this this morning, I just don't know that you can have fun in church. You might need to check your fun button because it might be stuck. Amen. We're going to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John and we'll be reading two verses to start this morning. The second and the third verse. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Alright, close enough. In my Father's house, Christ says to us, are many mansions. If it were not so... I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Notice, notice his emphasis there that, that he's saying, if I go and prepare a place for you, oh, be rest assured, I'm going to come and get you to take you there. He, he, you know, he's... He, God is not futile. He's not going to waste his time to go make a place for us and then forget to come get us and take us there. Amen? He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and then I will come to receive you unto myself and take you there. Now, okay, we hear that, and it sounds good. But there is a place of faith that rises up in us when we have a level of understanding. When we begin to study the scriptures and when we begin to understand the deeper things of God, when we literally begin to search the spirit and we have ears to hear what he is trying to tell us. This is matrimonial language that he is speaking. He is, he is literally speaking a marriage language to us in 14.2 and 14.3. Now, if you don't know the day or the, the, the time, the season, you, you may not see that. But I want to explain to you this Jewish carpenter who taught in a land and a day the ordinance, just briefly, of a Jewish wedding in the days of Christ. You see, the first thing that would occur when a good Jewish boy was ready to marry a good Jewish girl is a contract would be drawn up. Literally, there would be a covenant that was made. There's a reason that we call this the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. There is a reason that this living word is called a covenant. It's not just the New Testament. Right. It's the New Covenant. You see, a marriage contract was drawn up between the groom and the bride. The, the, the groom would select his bride and then he would come to the place where his bride was. And he would come bearing a covenant of betrothal. A covenant of marriage. There was a price that was to be paid for the bride. I want you to understand. The scripture tells us over and over again. We are the bride of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. You see, this word is his covenant with us. His covenant of marriage. His covenant of betrothal to us. And just as in that day, a price had to be paid for the bride. A price has been paid for us as the bride. It was paid in his flesh. It was paid in his blood. Literally, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the price that he paid for us to be his bride. This covenant would have been signed by the groom. In this case, literally, it was signed in blood. 
We, we talk about, well, you know, if something's serious, you better sign it in blood. Amen? This covenant, this contract, it was signed in blood. Now, there was a betrothal ceremony. There, there literally was a ceremony where the groom and his bride, after the presentation of this covenant, after the price was paid, literally there was a ceremony at which they were betrothed. They were promised to one another. And literally the covenant was ratified. The covenant was ratified symbolically by the bride drinking from a cup that was presented by the groom. The groom would drink of a cup and present it to the bride and the bride would drink of the cup. And when they both had taken part, taken of the cup, they were considered to be betrothed unto one another. They were considered to be legally joined one unto another. They were promised one unto another. They were to have no part of anyone else. Amen? Sound a little bit like communion? When, when today, it, as is our customary behavior here at the Garden of Grace, after the message today and after prayer time, we will believe God for an opportunity to receive communion today. We literally are presenting the covenant right now. We are presenting the word of God. And then it is our purpose in Christ to make a moment for all of those who want to commit their life to Christ to do so. To make a commitment literally to accept that marriage covenant. To be joined unto the Lamb of God. And then to immediately ratify that by partaking of the communion elements. Literally Christ said, this is my body and my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. We partake of those elements, promising ourselves. That is literally what you do. If you think that you're just taking communion and it's something lightly, you are literally promising yourself in purity and in marriage to the bridegroom, Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. You are literally Amen. pledging your pure and chaste self to the Holy Groom. And we do this by His commandment whenever we come together. That we may remember the covenant that we have made. For you see, it is a time yet before the bridegroom returns to collect his bride. So when we come together as believers, we partake of those communion elements to remind ourselves that we are pledged to another. Not pledged to this world, but pledged to another. That being Jesus Christ. Now an interesting thing happened. You see, they were promised one unto another. They were pledged one unto another. They had a legally binding union, but it was not consummated. We're adults in here today. We understand what it is to consummate a marriage. The absolute physical intimacy that occurs in a marriage bed between a man and a woman is a picture and an image. It is a type. It, God tells us that in that moment, the two become one. Literally one flesh. The marriage was not consummated with the physical act at that moment of betrothal. But legally they were married. They were promised one unto another. And they were to be separated and kept for one another and no one else. And then something fascinating happens. The bridegroom, the groom, would leave. He would depart. He would go back to his father's house for about a year. Literally, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Literally, this, this promised groom would leave and go back to his father's house. And he would begin to fashion on his father's house. A dwelling place for he and his bride. He would literally begin to build a, a living quarters, a room onto his father's house. That one day he and his bride would live in. His bride would remain in her place. And she would be making preparations for the marriage life. You see, she was committed, but she was being prepared. Oh, 
If you can't see the symbolism, if you can't understand that we are the bride and that we are in this place and we are being prepared for the day that we will be reunited with Him in unity physically and that He has gone to His Father's, our Father's house and that He is right now preparing a place for us there. You see, I, I've heard it taught and, I, and I, I've read it and seen it that people would say that Jesus used this image to paint a picture for us. That's foolishness. No, Jesus didn't take advantage of the marriage customs to teach us a lesson. God gave the Hebrew people the marriage ceremony. God said, this is how you will get married. This is what the ceremony will look like. There was a reason and a purpose that He gave the ceremony. He gave the ceremony to us in the natural that we could understand the supernatural. God gave us something in the physical that we could understand the spiritual. It is not an accident. It is not a coincidence. God didn't seize on the opportunity to teach this lesson. God purposed because He knew that He was coming to redeem us. He gave to the Jewish people along with His Word this right and this custom of marriage that He may show us what is yet to come. That He may teach us intimacy. Oh, y'all got to get more excited about this Word. <laughs> Jesus, the groom... He was gone for about a year. And he would return to collect his bride. You see, the thing is, nobody knew exactly when he was coming back. Nobody knew exactly when he was returning to fetch his bride, to catch his bride away, and to take her with him to his father's house. Nobody really knew the day or the hour. But he usually came at night. In the darkness. Come on, son. You've got to, come on. He came. In the darkness, he came to collect his bride when nobody really knew. It, they, they would, he would come with a wedding party. He would bring those that were already with him. And he would come into town in the midst of the darkness. They would come carrying lights. And they would come to retrieve the bride. They would sound a trumpet to announce that the moment had come that they had been waiting for. And he would come and catch away the bride in her bridal party that was prepared. And they would return to his father's house. If, if you don't understand yet that this is a picture of the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ, that He is the groom, that we are the bride, and He is coming into the darkness to take us out of the darkness and take us to a place that He has prepared for us in His Father's house. This, this is our hope. This is, this is the day that we await. That's good, right? It gets better. You see, once the groom had came and, and he fetched up his bride, he, along with the bridal party, they would return all together to his father's house. And they would begin a seven-day feast. A seven-day feast like you have never seen people feast. Now, the beginning of this feast, the first thing that would happen is literally the bride and the groom would be joined together together. They would consummate the marriage. They would know the ultimate intimacy. They would be joined as one. Literally, the Bible tells us, and I believe it's 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. God tells us that when a man and a woman come together in marriage and in that physical act of consummation, that they become one flesh. We literally, on that glorious day, are joined to the Lord, one with Him. Yes. Not in a type or in a shadow, but literally, oh my goodness, all of His glory, all of His love. They, they literally, at the beginning of this seven day feast, the groom and the bride would, would go away into this marital chamber and they would consummate the marriage. And for seven days, there would be a feast. Yet, the bride would be kept hidden away during this seven-day feast. For those of you that believe that the Christian church is going through the tribulation, instead of being hidden from the tribulation, you see, she was, the bride was taken away for seven years, for seven days, she was hidden. 
The Lord says a day is as a year is as a thousand years. For seven days she would be hidden away. And at the conclusion of the seven day feast, what we would literally know is the seven year tribulation. Oh, glory. The groom would emerge with his bride to present her to everyone. Just as Christ at the end of the seven years of the tribulation in his second coming will return to this earth and he will bring with us his spotless, glorious bride. And the whole world will see for a thousand years the millennial reign of Christ and his bride on this earth. It is an absolute picture of the fulfillment of this marriage ceremony. The Lord told us in, in the first chapter, the 20th verse of Romans, that, that the invisible things of His nature are seen in what is revealed and what is known. He literally gives us the natural that we may understand the supernatural. Literally, the bride, after seven days, was unveiled. Literally, she went into the bridal chamber with a veil. They consummated. And after seven days, the veil was lifted and the glorious bride was revealed to the whole world. And the two were one. But better still, guys are going to love this part. Guys are going to want to convert to Judaism. <laughs> For the first year that the couple was married, their singular and sole task was to consummate the marriage over and over and get to know each other. They, he was not allowed to work for the first year. They were not allowed to work. They were only allowed to spend time together, knowing each other, building their intimacy, and consummating their marriage again and again for the first year of marriage. I told you, we're going to lose some of the church right there in two days. A day is as a thousand years to the Lord. That year of the bride and the groom knowing each other, celebrating, enjoying, rejoicing in their first year of marriage, knowing each other is literally a prophetic image of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ and His bride on this earth when there will be no war, there will be absolute peace, there will be no violence, no evil. Satan and all of hell will be bound for a thousand years. There will be no evil on the face of the earth. And, and, and Christ will sit with us, His glorious bride. And for a thousand years, we will just enjoy one another. Hallelujah. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, we find some additional insight into this. We find a, a most curious parable. It's a parable of ten virgins. It says to us in the 25th chapter, in the first verse, and we'll read about 13 verses this morning. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, again, this is Jesus Christ teaching. This is, this is that point that he's teaching on the last days. He's teaching through all of this immediately before the last supper and the crucifixion. He, Jesus says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. You see, when the bride was covenanted, when she signed that covenant to the groom, when they had the ceremony and they were pledged to one another, there was assigned to her ten virgins, ten chaste and pure, ten virgins that were to remain with her at all times. And at all times they were to have oil lamps that were trimmed and oil that was ready. For you see, at any moment the groom could come. And he almost always came in the darkness to fetch them. So they had to be ready, even though they knew not the hour or the moment. So we have right here this picture of this bridal party. These ten chaste virgins with their oil lamps awaiting the return of the groom. But we find in verse 2 that of this wedding party, five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish, they took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise, they had oil in their vessels with their lamps. 
Notice they had oil in the lamp, but they had some extra they were carrying. The bridegroom, while the bridegroom tarried, which means while they waited on the bridegroom, they all slumbered and slept. They didn't know the hour. And at midnight, there was a cry that went out over the land. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all of the wedding party, they arose and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish, the unprepared, said unto the wise who were prepared, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. There is no light in us. Verse 9. But the wise who had the oil in the fire, they answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather yourselves to them that sell. And get your own oil. Verse 10. And while the foolish went to buy. The bridegroom he came. And they that were ready. They went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the others. The five foolish saying. Lord, Lord open unto us. But he said I, I, I know you not. Jesus admonishes us, therefore, to watch. For we know neither the hour nor the day wherein the Son of Man cometh. Herein He illuminates when He says, when the Son of Man cometh. He says, I'm telling you a parable. I'm telling you a story, a picture, something you need to know. You need to understand that I am your bridegroom. That I am coming at an hour that you knoweth not. The oil always represents the Holy Spirit. The oil represents the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now notice all ten. They had a lamp. It's surely a little bit of oil in it. For you see, we are all created by our God. And it is His Spirit that gives us life. We all in this life, while we are awaiting His return, we have a touch of His Spirit. Otherwise, there would be no life in us. Even the lost soul would have no life. There's a touch of oil. But you see, there's coming a day. There's coming a day of reckoning. There is coming a day when He will return to fetch us away. And it will be in an hour we do not expect. It may very well be that He raptures us through the sky. But you know, He may come to collect us through the grave. Because you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to fly. Amen? You don't know if He's getting you through the grave or if He's getting you through the sky. But you can rest assured there will come a day of reckoning. There will come a day when you will be collected unto Him. And the question becomes, in that moment of reckoning, in that moment of reckoning, do you have simply the little bit of spirit that He gave to give you life to get through this earth? Or do you have that other vessel, that jar of oil that allows that light to burn bright in you? For it literally tells us that when we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, when we are born again, that He seals our heart with His Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. That is the measure of the vessel. See, it's not what we're carrying in us, but it's what He brings. It's that other vessel, that other oil, that other anointing that fills us up that our light will be burning in the night and in the darkness that he comes to collect us out of his church oh hallelujah by the way the last time i checked it, oh somebody may get upset but the last time i checked mohammed didn't promise to come back to get us the last time i checked buddha didn't promise to come back to get us the last time i checked the dalai lama didn't come back to get us the last time i checked fred down the street didn't promise to come back to get us I've not even promised to come back to get you. 
Okay, there is one and one alone whom we worship because there is one and one alone who is coming back to collect his bride. We are promised unto him. We are not promised unto another. We cannot be promised unto another. If you want to know why God hates adultery so much, it is because he wants a pure and a chaste virgin. We are promised unto him and no one else. We are not to give ourselves or this vessel to another. Never at any point. We are set aside for him, for intimacy with him, and no one else. <clears throat> Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. I'm telling you, this, this, this word is throughout His Word. This is, this is not a couple of verses and we, we, we drew something out of it. it. This concept of us being His bride and Him being our groom is found throughout His Word. One Thessalonians, fourth chapter, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, but I, I love these words, I love Paul, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Study to show thyself approved. Listen to the word that I'm speaking to you, that you are not ignorant in the streets. Amen. Concerning them which are asleep, Literally, those that have passed from this life. Literally, those that have died. Don't be ignorant. Don't be worried in your fear. Don't walk and fret for those that have passed on from this life. But rejoice. Because I don't want you to sorrow. Even as the other sorrow which have no hope in redemption. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. What does the Bible say in Romans 9 and 10? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, it says you will be saved. Paul is saying if you believe that Jesus is God, if you are saved, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. We just heard about the bridal party. He said those that have already left will come back with him to receive the bride. When the groom came back, he brought a wedding party with him. He brought those that are already from his hometown with him to come collect the bride and the rest of the wedding party. It's just the Bible. Verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we... Listen to what Paul said. He said, this is not an idea I had. This I say unto you as the word of the Lord. It is by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not pre pre precede them which are asleep. That word prevent means precede. Paul is saying, look, if you're alive and your feet are on this earth and the day that Christ breaks the eastern sky to come back to collect His church will not go before the ones that have already gone on because the ones that have already gone on are with Jesus and they're coming back with Him. Jesus Christ said, the, the word of the Lord says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment that we pass from this life, we go immediately into the presence of the living God. There is no third option. There is no waiting room. There's no time out place. That we are either in hell or we are in paradise we leave this earth and we go to paradise to be with our Lord Amen. immediately and those that have already gone on to paradise when he comes back to collect his bride they will be the wedding party we have the imagery they will come back with Christ to collect us his bride who yet remain in this earth and we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep, which have gone on before us. Verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Not an angel, not a messenger, but the Lord Jesus Christ Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord our God in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Say ever. Ever, ever shall we be with the Lord. Then verse 18. Comfort one another with these words. He literally says, comfort one another with these words. These words should be a comfort unto one another. We should remind one another of the hope in which we live. We should remind one another of the hope of those that we have lost in this life, Amen. that they are yet waiting to yeah. meet us with our Lord. Yes. 
I want to show you something really cool. Verse 17. It says that we will be caught up with them in the clouds. This is literally what, what people have labeled the rapture. The, the rapture is a catching away, a snatching away. People say the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, if you read it in Latin, you get the Latin word that we get rapture for, okay? It, it, it's just, it, it's the catching away. It's the snatching away. It is when Christ comes. But He comes in the cloud. Amen? Amen? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. We've talked about that before. But there was a translation that was made a long time ago called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, what they did is they took the Old Testament Hebrew and they converted it into Greek. So that those that knew Greek and not Hebrew, specifically as Gentiles, could study the Old and the New Covenant in Greek. Eventually those were translated into English and is the Bible we have now today. But there's something fascinating. You see, when you read the Old Testament account in Exodus, and you read that the Lord went before the people as a cloud by day, and as a cloud of fire at night, it's the same word. It is the same word, nephele, used here in verse 17 that is used in Exodus, which literally means that this glory cloud that read, led the Israelites out of bondage is the same glory cloud that's going to lead us out of this earth. We are literally going to be caught up into His glory. We are going to be caught up into that same cloud. And notice, notice that during the day, for those that walked, when they walked in the light, it was a cloud of His glory. But for those when they walked in the darkness, it was a cloud of fire. This is prophetic revelation. You want to get this, okay? This is, this is good. When He returns, for those that are walking in the light, it will be His cloud of glory that we will be caught up into. But for those that are walking in the darkness, they will see His fire. It will be a cloud of fire in judgment for those that are in darkness. It will be a cloud of glory for those that are walking in the light. Somebody give the Lord a shout for the goodness of His Word. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. It tells us in Matthew chapter 24, the, the question everybody wants to know. Lord Jesus, what are the signs of your coming? When are you coming? We read in the 24th verse, in the, in the 24th chapter, in the 3rd verse, His disciples, His closest followers said, When is the day? When are you coming? When is the end of the world? Notice they said, When are you coming? And when is the end of the world? A couple of separate events, by the way. This world will not pass away, just for the record. It will be heavily renovated, Amen. but it's not going to disappear. All those that have a theory that the earth is just going to explode and disappear, that's not what the Bible tells us. But it is going to go undergo some serious renovation work. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Our master builder is going to build a new place. Amen. Hallelujah. But, but everybody wanted to know. They said, Lord, what's the sign? When do we know? We read in, in Matthew verse 27, and, and all of these are in the 24th chapter. Jesus says, for as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the Son of Man be. A lightning is a fast flash, amen? It's a quick flash of light. It's literally going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be flying before we know it, amen? It's just, it, boom, going to be transformed. You know, some have said that, that, that those, that, that it may be that it's not just going to look like the sound, but some have, some, have, some have theorized, and, and, and there may be some truth to it, that when that trumpet shouts, when that trumpet sounds, for those of us that are in Christ, that are in the light, we will hear the trumpet sound, because we will have ears to hear. But for those that are walking in darkness, they may not have ears to hear. They may only hear a clap of thunder. That may be all they hear, just a clap of thunder, because they're in the darkness. But, but we who walk in the light, we will hear the trumpet, we will see the flash of light, and we will be caught up with him in that day. He said in verse 36, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In verse 30, 42, he says, Watch therefore, for ye know not the hour that your Lord cometh. He says in verse 44, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour you think the Son of Man cometh, he doesn't. Okay, in one chapter, 
at least four times he's told us, we will not know the day or the hour. <coughs> no man will. Amen. Okay? Amen. If you've got a book that tells you when Christ is coming back, throw it in the garbage. It's wrong. Okay? If you've got a word that you know when Christ is coming back and you want to tell everybody, don't tell anybody because you're wrong. Okay? No man knows. And matter of fact, if you think you know, he tells you that ain't when he's coming back. Okay? So, we don't know. Our only hope is to keep the oil, to keep the fire, to keep the lamp burning, to keep the light burning bright. And don't worry if it gets dark because he's coming back most likely in the darkness to collect us, his bride. And he will take us with him and we will be joined to him. Join to him. How does that work? Check this out with me. We're, we're going to close around this section of Scripture. Go with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. I know the youth are coming back. We'll just let them filter in and get seated quickly. <laughs> Boy, they're going to get an earful in just a moment. Hallelujah. I thought we'd get to this before they got back, but oh well. You know, God's word's God's word. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. We're going to start in the 35th verse. What's it going to look like? I mean, as exciting as it is to know that he's coming back and he's going to catch us away. Then what? Then what? Check it out. Verse 35. But some man will say, I, I thank God that it doesn't say some woman. because it is, Some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Verse 36, thou fool. Another dumb question you ask. That which thou sowest is not quickened, literally made alive, except it die. Literally, Paul's being asked the question. He's saying, okay, well, you know, this body, how, how, how is it made alive? How does it come in the day to come? Verse 37, he tells us, that which you sow, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. Literally, people get all worked up about preserving this body. Because somehow they think, well, you know, you've got to have this body in the next life. Uh-uh-uh-uh. No, no, no. He's saying, look, you know, don't get so worked up about the flesh and body. Because all it is, is it's a bare seed. It is just a seed. It, it's not this body that you sow into the ground. When, when you give up the ghost, when you breathe your last, when, you, when your spirit and your soul pass on, this flesh, it returns to the earth from which it came. It is not this vessel that God raises up again. It is not this flesh that is quickened. You literally are just sowing a seed of what is yet to come. Verse 38. But God giveth that seed, a body as it has pleased Him. And to every seed, His own body. Your supernatural body, my supernatural body that will stand in His glory and His presence will be a body that He has given. Not a body that I have created. Not a body that I have found. Not even a body that I have imagined. But it will be a body that comes from God as it pleases Him. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you right now are wishing that you could have given your wife a body that pleased you. Some of you are wishing you could have given your husband a body that pleased you. But God says, I will give you a body in the life to come that will please me. And how many know his taste is better than our taste? Amen. Come on, somebody. He goes on to tell us in verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are celestial bodies, meaning heavenly bodies, and there are terrestrial, meaning earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial body, the heavenly body, is one thing, and the glory of the terrestrial body, the earthly body, is another thing. Verse 31, 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, one of different, they differ. He's saying over and over again, this body now is not like the body to come. The body to come is going to be so different than this one. I love this analogy, this, this picture of the moon and the sun. You know, the moon has been called a dead planet. Yet it reflects God's, it reflects the light of the sun. The only reason that the moon gives off light is because it is reflecting 
the sun. Yet the sun is described as this alive, dynamic, on fire thing. It issues forth light. You see, our body today is, is much like the moon. It can only reflect God's light. It is just a dead vessel that is reflecting His glory. But there is coming a day very soon when we will have a new body given by Him that will be glorious in His sight. Verse 42, so is the resurrection of the dead. This dead body, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It says right there, verse 44, there's a natural body and then there's something else. A supernatural, a spiritual body. We... We don't just have the promise of Him taking us out of this life. We don't just have the promise of His love. We have the promise of a completely new body in Christ. Verse 45, he goes on to make his point. As it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Literally a making alive spirit. Our first body, our earthly body, is a picture of Adam. The body to come is a picture of the body of Christ. Hallelujah. That same Jesus that after the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday, that same Jesus that walked through a locked door, that same Jesus that showed up and they handled Him, they touched Him, and come on, saints, He ate. He ate fried fish. He ate on the beach. He ate in the house. He ate. I said He ate. Come on, saints. He ate. We like to eat now. That new body, it's going to eat too. Amen. They could hold it. They could touch it. But in the twinkling of an eye, it was gone somewhere else. You're not going to need a bus pass in the life to come. Amen. You're going to think a thought and you are there. You are going to think a thought and you are in that place. And you're going to think it's time to leave this place and you're going to be gone to some other place. Hallelujah. How be it. That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterwards, that which is spiritual. He's saying in verse 36, 46, why did we first get a natural body and then a spiritual body? Verse 47, the first man is of the earth and earthly. The second man is the Lord himself from heaven. Hallelujah. Verse 48, as in the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as in the heavenly, such are they that are also heavenly. In this earthly realm, we are bound in our flesh by some of the natural laws. But in the heavenly realm, it is the heavenly laws that will guide us through all truth. And then guide us through eternity. Hallelujah. Praise God. And verse 49. And as we have been born in the image of the earthly, shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. Want to know what you're going to look like in the life to come? You're going to look like Jesus. Christ. Amen. You're going to look like the heavenly beings. Hallelujah. We are created in His image and we will return unto His image. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Read it with me, saints. Behold, verse 51. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Some will leave this earth by the grave. Some will leave this earth by the sky. But we will all be changed. Verse 51. Verse 52. And how fast will we be changed? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall forever be changed. Hallelujah. In the twinkling of an eye. We will put on incorruption. We will put on immortality. We will put on eternity. Yes. Hallelujah. Why? Why? Just because He loves us? Check this out. Paul affirms for us in his letter to the Corinthians in the 13th verse, this whole parable of the marriage. Paul says in, in, chapter, in, in chapter 13, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians, he says to his followers, we see now through a glass darkly, meaning kind of a glass mirror, just a reflection, just an image, just a shadow of, of what is yet to come. But one day, we shall see face to face. No mirror, no shadow. Face to face, pure intimacy. 
It's, it's one thing to talk to somebody on Skype. It's another thing to have them face to face and to smell their breath and to feel the warmth of their body and to look deep within the soul of their eyes. He says, one day, our Christ will be face to face. For, you know what, we know in part right now, we see a type, we have a shadow, we have a little bit of understanding of His glory, we have a little bit of understanding of His love, we have a little bit of understanding of intimacy with Him. We, we know what it's like to be brushed by a kiss. But in that day, I will know Him as He even knows me now. You see, the Bible tells us that, that He knows the very numbers the number of hairs on our very head. The Bible tells us that He knows our every thought. He knows what we're thinking before we think it. And the Bible also tells us that in that day, when we become one with Him, we will know His very thoughts. We will know the numbers of hairs on His head. We will have this intimacy with the Lord. It's the grown-up part. In the marriage bed, there is a moment, a climactic moment. There, there, there is an ultimate moment of climax when a man and a woman are joined together that is a type of intimacy that is overwhelming. It, it's for a split second there is a, I, I trust we all understand what we're talking about. For a split second, there is a moment of intimacy where you are completely lost in that person and in that moment. It, it is in that split second that it more than at any other moment you feel joined one flesh, one unto another. It, it, it is literally the climactic moment of that union of two flesh becoming one. Some would describe that moment as ecstasy. You're going to love this. Do you know the Webster's Dictionary definition of ecstasy? Rapturous delight. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on. Good Lord. Webster's Dictionary defines ecstasy as rapturous delight. That moment that we will be absolutely intimately what I am telling you. For those of you that have been married, those of you that should have been married, that have experienced that moment, that, that split second moment of ecstasy, your mind right now needs to understand that there is a distinct possibility that a greater expression of its ecstasy will eternally be ours. It won't be gone in a split second. It literally, that, we're going to live in that ecstasy in His presence forever and then some because this life is just a type. It's just, a, I am telling you, the reason we're going to have a spiritual supernatural body is because we would die. We, we would literally die. We would explode. We couldn't handle it. Oh my goodness. I mean, I'm going to give you a minute. I really want the revelation to hit you. I, I've, been, I've been swimming in it for a couple of weeks waiting to bring this word of what God has shown. That joy, that uncontrollable joy, when you don't care what you look like, you completely are outside yourself. You've lost yourself. It, that is a taste of the ecstasy, the joy. The, the, oh my gosh. In Christ. It's undescribable what it will be to be joined to Him in that day that He breaks the eastern sky. In that day that we pass through the grave and are joined to Him. There is not words that we can describe it with. We don't have the vocabulary, the language to describe it. We don't have the flesh to contain it. It will require another language. It will require a supernatural body. It will be more than we can stand. His glory will be so intense that we'll have to have a glorified body just to withstand the light. Just to withstand the joy. Just to withstand the happiness, the peace, the ecstasy, the intimacy. Oh my goodness. 
I hope somebody's excited about the Lord coming back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Paul says to his followers in Corinth, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. I, Paul, have, I, I, I've betrothed you, I've taught you, I've prepared you, I've conditioned you for one husband, not another. Not, not, not this world, not the gods of this world, not, not, not the, the false religions, not the false prophets. None of, I have espoused you, I have prepared you by my word for one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Not to another, but to Christ. You have been set apart for Christ. There is to be no adultery to other gods. There is to be no adultery to other things. But we have been set apart and prepared. We are a bride that is awaiting the return of our groom. We have been prepared for Christ. Verse 3. But Paul says, but I fear. Lest by any means. As the serpent beguiled Eve. Through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Amen. This gospel is not complicated. Amen. It is simple. God loves us. He married us. He died for us to seal the covenant in His blood. And we are to wait for Him to return. We are not to take another lover while we are waiting for Him to come back in His glory to get us. It is just that simple. He died for our salvation, not in and of ourselves. We, 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 the servant beguiled Eve. We are still fighting the same battle. The serpent came to Eve and said, If you want to be like God, Eve, you need to do it in your works. You need to partake of the tree. You need to do a little work, Eve, if you want to be like God. Jesus, Paul says, it is so simple. Christ has done the work. Christ has died that we can be with Him, that we can be like Him, that we can be in Him. It's just that simple. Throw away the works. Throw away the religion. Throw away the law. Throw away the oppression. Get Christ. Christ Jesus.